Our presenter today is Mohit Sharma, Applications Engineer for Relay Products. Mohit is based out of our Dallas office in Texas. Thank you for joining us, Mohit. Thank you, Greg, for introducing me. Um, I'm Mohit Sharma, working as a Relay Applications Engineer at uh, Mega Dallas. So today's uh, topic of webinar is breaker failure protection. So this is uh, we will be covering in um, our today's webinar. We will start with um, what exactly is breaker failure protection, why do we need that, how different it is from the traditional scheme of remote backup. Um, then we will jump on to the implementation part where we will discuss how exactly in the field uh, you implement a breaker failure protection. The next slides cover a couple of slides will cover some of the schemes that uh, the breaker failure relay uh, incorporate in them. Uh, we will see how there are different logic gates for that. Then we will talk about some of the relay examples uh, to see a practical relay working for breaker failure. And finally, we will talk about testing a couple of slides. Okay. Starting with uh, what is breaker failure? So according to IEEE C37.119, which is a standard for breaker failure protection, they have categorized um, the breaker failure in these categories. So the first two that you can see are failure to trip and failure to clear. According to the standard, these two are called as breaker failure. The rest of them, which are down below, can lead to a breaker failure, but they are not categorized exactly as breaker failure, but they can eventually lead to a breaker failure. So let's start with failure to trip. What exactly is failure to trip? Let's say I, I, see, a, I see a trip from a relay um, and it energizes my tripping coil for the breaker, but somehow due to some short or open in the trip circuit or some mechanical problem, my breaker is unable to trip. That is the case when you say it's a failure to trip. The second category for breaker failure is failure to clear, which means your tripping coil is energized, your breaker is opening, but um, and your 52A contacts get picked up. So you, you can see everything, but the arc is not extinguished. The arc is still there. That is a case uh, which is also a breaker failure and it is called as failure to clear. The other ones uh, which can lead to a breaker failure are failure to close, which is a stuck breaker condition, like your breaker is stuck and it's not able to close due to some mechanical problems. Then you have contact flashover. This example is um, quite often when you see a restrike of an opening breaker. You're opening the breaker and there is a restrike occurring and your contacts get flashed over and you don't uh, sense a 52-way contact getting picked up. Loss of dielectric. So if your dielectric pressure falls below a certain level, then your current is not interrupted and it can eventually lead to a breaker fail. Failure to trip under load. If your mechanical failure is happening while you're switching the loads uh, and it's not a fault condition, it's just a load condition. And failure to trip under those circumstances can also eventually lead to a breaker fail. Okay, let's now talk about, uh, it, take an example, which is an IEEE standard example. It's a two source model. You have sources A and sources B, source B. And you have a couple of breakers here. I have uh, denoted all the breakers, their numbers. So now we will, in the further slides, we will only talk number three or number four or number six like that. Assume we have a fault here between breaker three and breaker four. So if there is proper functioning of both the breakers, you will see a proper clearing, which will open your breaker three and your breaker four. And there is no infeed from the sources to the fault and your fault is cleared. But 
let's take now this example where you have a breaker three, which is faulty, which means it's it's seeing a breaker fail condition. It, it is not able to open up or some other problem. In that case, if we have a remote backup protection, which was the traditional scheme used to, uh, in olden days for it, electromechanical relays, um, my relay, which is there at breaker one, the remote relay at breaker one, and if it is configured for a forward sensing fault, it will see the fault and it will trip after some coordination time delay. Same goes with number six and number eight, because number six and number eight are connected to B source. If I don't open them, then the B source can feed my fault. So we see this happening after some time. We have an open condition for one, six, and eight, so there is no feeding of fault from any of the sources now, and your fault can be cleared. This is just a remote breaker backup. Now consider this scenario where you where you have tap loads between your generator buses and the substation bus. And your generator bus and the substation. You have a couple of tap loads. We will talk about this scenario and we will see the disadvantages of uh, this remote breaker backup scheme and uh, how this is not a very good option uh, these days. Okay. The first disadvantage is that the strength of sources might lead to an underreach, which means, let's say, we have a source A, which is a weak source, and uh, the fault happening here between breaker three and breaker four, if it is not able to sense the fault, the relay here, then it will not trip, even after the coordination delay. So I, I have an O-close condition without a trip in this breaker one but there was a breaker fail condition. So I don't see a trip here. The second disadvantage could be coordination delay. It, it, it might be too long before this guy, the relay here at breaker one, senses, uh, okay, there is a fault and my primary backup protection, which was there for my breaker three, did not operate. Now it's my job or my responsibility to trip my breaker but it can take a coordination time delay which could be which could be long and i don't want my system to get unstabilized or destabilized by that if it's a it's a serious fault third disadvantage comes to when you have tap loads i specifically considered this example because it has some tap loads here here and here so if you take out this breaker or if you take out this breaker you are putting an outage to all the loads which are connected to with this tap. So your breaker one is out, which means there is, an, there is no load here, no supply to this load. Or if your breaker six or breaker eight are out, you, you cannot have any supply to these. So I don't want my other loads to get affected by a fault which happened between breaker three and four. I want to have a reliable supply. The advantage, the only advantage of um, this remote backup scheme is uh, it does not require an additional hardware equipment. Um, that is the only advantage. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, what is uh, breaker failure, how it is uh, useful and how it is more better when compared with the normal remote backup scheme. Considering the same example, you have sources A and B and a fault happens between three and four. So if you have a breaker failure uh, protection scheme, what it, it will, what it, it will have some logics inside that and it will run a timer. We will cover about this box in the further slides, but just giving you a heads up, it will have some logic inside that and it will have a timer and after the timer expires, it will sense a breaker failure condition and it will give 
a breaker failure trip to the local breakers, which is number two, five, and seven. Also, it will give a direct transfer trip to the breaker four. So in this case, you can see that uh, I am still supplying my loads which were connected here with the taps. So there is no outage. It is a fast um, in operation when compared with the normal coordination delay. It will minimize the damage to the grid. And um, the tap load was like it will minimize the power interruption to consumers. The one more advantage of having a breaker failure uh, scheme is it's just a functional duplication of a very expensive equipment, which is breaker. So it is exactly sensing what breaker it's it's talking about breaker and it's sensing the breaker conditions. That's why we need breaker failure protection. This is why we need breaker failure protection, why it is more important in today's world. Okay. Now coming to the implementation part, how we can implement this whole protection scheme in out in the field. There are two possibilities of implementing this protection um, out in the field. The, we will talk about the first possibility, which is having a standalone breaker failure relay, like a complete new different box, a standalone box for sensing all these breaker failure conditions. Okay, let's talk about what is happening here. I have a protective relay, which will see which will which will see current from CTs and voltages from PTs and will decide from its internal logic whether it's a fault condition or not. Okay, if it senses a fault condition, this is hardwired to a dedicated a breaker failure relay, which is a standalone unit. And if it senses a fault condition, it will initiate a command called as BFI, which is nothing but a breaker failure initiation. We will talk about this in the further slides, just to, to explain what it is. So BFI, it will initiate a breaker failure initiation. You have a standalone breaker here, breaker failure relay here. It also senses the current. With this BFI and with this sensing of current, it will run its internal logic and with a, after a timer, it will give a breaker failure trip output, which will go to my different breakers, like the local breakers I explained. Here is two, five, and seven. It will go there and it will trip those breakers to clear the fault. like this. The second condition or a second implementation could be a protective relay that has an inbuilt uh, breaker failure protection logic inside that. So it does not require an external or an additional hardware equipment. So you have a protective relay which will sense current coming from the CTs, uh, voltages coming from the PTs, and it will also have its own breaker failure scheme inside that. This relay will also have an input for breaker failure initiation. Now you would ask me, why, why do I require a breaker failure initiation input for this relay? It's because if you are connected in a multi-breaker system where you have many breakers, um, I, my, this protective relay should be able to see a breaker failure initiation coming from a different breaker failure relay in the system. Okay, what I'm trying to say here is, I have a breaker failure for this breaker and I have a breaker failure relay for this breaker. So this will sense the initiation command coming from here. So it should have an input for breaker failure initiation. That's what it is. And if it decides from its internal logic that, okay, there is a breaker failure condition, I will give a breaker failure trip here to trip my local breakers. It, there is also a possibility that it should, it's not taking a BFI from the other breaker failure relays. It run its own BFI 
and with its with its fault detector, we, we will cover about what fault detectors are. With the CT input to be in the layman terms, it will decide some logic and then it will issue a breaker failure trip after the timer elapses. That's how we can implement a breaker failure scheme out in the field. So two ways, breaker failure relay or a protective come breaker failure relay. Okay. Now we have understood what is a breaker failure. We have understood why do we need that, how different and how beneficial it is when compared with the traditional schemes, and how to implement that out in the field. Now we will talk about all the logics, what is happening inside the breaker failure scheme here. As I was talking about this BFI and a 50 BF, in my previous slides. So let me explain you what BFI is and what this 50 BF is. So a BFI is nothing but a protective relay trip signal, which is called as breaker failure initiation in the breaker failure protection world. 50 BF is nothing but a presence of fault current. It will have settings of pickup value, pick up time, drop out value, and drop out time. To explain it in a basic scheme, this is a basic scheme, and this scheme is taken from the IEEE standards, and many manufacturers utilize this scheme. What is happening here is there is an AND gate, and it will sense a breaker failure initiation, which is a trip from a relay and it will also see whether my fault condition is still persisting or not from the ct or from from its yeah from the ct if you have both the conditions it will go here and it will wait for some time after this time elapses if you still see a 50 bf i mean a fault condition and a trip which means my breaker was unable to clear the fault and I, I can declare a breaker failure trip here. So that's how the basic scheme works. Okay, now let's talk. Okay, I'll explain that. So in all the diagrams before, red means the breaker was closed, breaker was in closed conditions and green means the breaker was in open condition. So we will now uh, cover here a breaker and a half configuration to have a better understanding in the actual world or in the actual or system uh, world. You have sources A, sources B, this is your breaker failure scheme. And you have loads F1, F3, F2, F4. You have transformers here, this is how it is. Let's assume you have a fault happening at feeder four. So according to the normal operation where you don't have any breaker fail condition, where your all the breakers are healthy, your fault will be cleared by the opening of six, breaker six and breaker nine. Let's say we have a B9, the breaker nine has a faulty breaker. So what will happen now? If my breaker nine is faulty, I, I have to shut off my feeder so that it does not have a current coming from the other sources. I don't want to feed my fault. So what I will do, before going to the part what I will do, let me tell you, we have breaker failure relay for all the breakers. We will assume that we have breaker failure relays for all the breakers, they have, they are out in the field. So what it will do, your, your breaker failure relay, which was there for breaker nine, it will see a breaker failure condition and the relay will try to give the trip command to the breaker to open it 
at the same time it will it will issue a bfi which is a breaker failure initiation and this breaker failure initiation signals will go to all these breakers to clear the fault because this is having a breaker failure condition it will initiate all the breaker failure initiation now the breaker failure relays here which are installed for all these breakers they will take the bfi as input and they will sense whether the fault is still persisting and after a timer they will trip their respective breakers this could be one scenario if you have breaker failure relays for all the breakers but if you don't have a breaker failure relay for them then you can also give you can also run the logic inside the breaker failure relay which is there for breaker failure breaker number 9 and you can initiate a breaker failure trip instead of an initiation to these breakers to trip them so the wait logic is happening inside the breaker failure relay for 9 in this case but in the previous case the wait logic was happening for these breakers so this is how you will clear the fault so you don't have any anything coming from here you have no source feeding the fault now talking about scheme 2 what is uh, what is scheme 2 and this scheme i have written as scheme 2 but um, many of the standards and papers have denoted the scheme called as 50 bf reset scheme um, this is applicable for ring bus and breaker and a half configurations so here let me explain you what is happening I have a BFI coming up it will pass through this timer and it will enable my 50 BF element which will be and gate to do which will have an and gate and it will issue a breaker failure trip okay why do we need this scheme um, where we can have this so to understand that let's go back here here and let's say I have a fault soon the fault happens my relay will issue a breaker failure initiation command and since there was a fault my 50 bf element will pick up it's just an element like a shadow of overcurrent element it will pick up so you have a yes i'm sorry a yes and a yes here which will issue a yes here so in this case everything is fine now let's see let's assume that the break the fault has been cleared which means my 50 bf should suddenly fall to zero and i should have a no a yes and a no here but that does not happen in the real world it the 50 bf element has a dropout value it has a dropout time and the dropout time for the 50 bf is a little bit higher than the pickup time so if that time is higher before and it's it's higher than this timer it the relay will issue a breaker failure trip but in actual condition you don't have a, a fault the fault has already been cleared so I can utilize this scheme for the reset of my 50 BF I can utilize this scheme and I can say okay I have a reset time so what will happen in this scenario is the breaker failure initiate will happen it will wait for some time and then it will enable the 50 BF it will wait for the pickup time of 50 BF and then issue a BFT so even if it has um, the fault is cleared if the fault is cleared you, your dropout time here can compensate with this this timer and I can say okay according to the settings which I enter in the relay I can say okay there is no breaker failure trip because my fault has already been cleared um, therefore this scheme comes into picture before moving on to the schema I just wanted to say that uh, these schemes I'm explaining one by one in the actual relay world 
there can be combination of these schemes in the single relay or in the single standalone breaker failure relay. So just giving you a heads up that these are not these schemes, only schemes in the breaker in the relay. Coming to the BFI ceiling scheme, which is uh, required when you have a very high speed relays. By high speed, I mean the trip contact uh, um, gets reset very quickly in those relays. So if it resets very quickly, then your BFI will momentarily go away. If it momentarily go away, I can, I can say, no, there is not a breaker failure trip, but it was actually a breaker failure trip. So I can, I can seal in my BFI from this scheme. I can seal in my BFI and can still issue a breaker failure trip. Now you will ask, okay, you have, you're explaining this condition, this scheme, that scheme, but you did not talk about the different type of faults and their effect on the power system. Um, can we have like a different scheme or different timers for different type of faults? Yes, we can. We can have that in this multiple timer scheme. So this will say that I have different timers for my different type of faults because a single phase fault is less prominent, not less severe in nature usually compared with the polyphase fault, like a three phase fault. So I would like to have my three phase fault issuing a breaker failure trip more quickly than a single phase fault because I don't want to unstable or destabilize my, my grid. And so I, I, I need to have different timers for, for both of these type of faults. So we can utilize this kind of a scheme where it says it will take all the elements from all the faces. It will run some logic two out of three. It will give to here and then you can take any of these for single phase. So 62.2 is timer for the single phase type of faults. 62.1 is the timer for your polyphase faults. So you can set according in the relay. Oh, okay, 62.2, 62.1, I will set, and then you can decide whatever you want. Okay, now we will talk about, we talked about the schemes we saw, implementation and everything. Now let's see what are the practical relays which are out in the world and how they utilize the scheme. Schweitzer 551. It's an overcurrent uh, relay and it has the, a breaker failure logic inside that. So this is not a, not a standalone box. It's a protective come breaker failure relay. So it utilizes this kind of a scheme where you have, where you can see that it is a combination of multiple schemes. Like you see a phase and neutral fault going to the AND gate. These are your fault detectors and this is your breaker failure initiation. Coming and waiting for some timer and giving a breaker failure trip to the output. It also employs a retrip logic to give the breaker a second opportunity to trip without, before declaring a breaker fail condition. SEL 352 is a, is a standalone box. It's a standalone um, breaker failure relay. It's not protective come breaker failure relay. Uh, and it has uh, multiple schemes, multiple schemes and multiple scenarios. So in that you can, you can select any of the schemes. Um, I have, I've taken the scheme for breaker and a half and ring bus. And, and they have also different logics and schemes for contact flash over failure to close, all the reclosing logics as well, and failure to trip under load conditions. So in the settings page, you will select what scheme it is you want to test or you want to do, implement, and this is how the logic for 352 works. There is an AND gate, and for each phase, it will go to an R, and either of these phase, if you see something happening, it will declare a breaker failure trip here. Um, coming to the testing part. So the research is going on uh, on testing the whole breaker failure protection scheme, like testing all the breakers, local breakers and everything. The work is still going on and the standard uh, still working on that. Um, but these days utilities employ testing uh, um, just a single 
just the breaker failure relay and not the whole scheme. We have a SMRT um, product line, which is the relay test set. And you can utilize that product line to test your breaker failure relay. It has the contacts, output, binary output contacts, and binary input contacts. The binary output could be used to sense or simulate a breaker, and the binary input can sense the trip coming from the relay. And you can inject current from your channels here to create a fault condition. We also have um, an automated testing solution uh, which has all the inbuilt modules or routines for uh, for different type of relays, also the breaker failure relays. Um, I have just taken one example for the GE Multilin F60, which is a protective cum breaker failure relay. It's a feeder management relay. The software is called as AVTS, Advanced Visual Testing Software, and it, you can see they have created a we have created a plan to test your breaker failure scheme in this relay. Concluding to this presentation, um, let's, let me tell about the ongoing work which is going on in this field right now. Um, the research is going on studying different case studies and bus configurations, uh, implementing or putting breaker failure protection into different bus configurations and checking whether the scheme which is which is there today um, is working fine or not. Uh, the research is also going on the employment of goose messages with your breaker failure protection. So this will eliminate uh, all the hard wiring which is which is there for your all the relays and breaker failure relays and breakers. It will it will work on the IEC 61850 standard and with the goose messages you can work, uh, make this happen. Um, also, there are some research going on settings to reduce the number of settings and easy to understand for a newcomer or for a, for anyone uh, to, to test a breaker failure really. And the testing methods, I was talking that research is going on for testing the whole breaker failure scheme and not just a single breaker failure relay. So that, that is also going on. So we, we covered uh, what and uh, why do we need breaker failure protection? Why, how it is different from your remote backup scheme? We talked about uh, how we implement that in the practical uh, world, which is your standalone units uh, and your inbuilt functionality and relays. And we also covered a couple of schemes. Those were only a couple of schemes. There are many schemes which the standard designate. So the schemes I talked about, they have uh, their name and everything written in the same format in the standard. And uh, all the relay manufacturers utilize the same name. They don't give the special name to, this, to that scheme. So you can easily understand uh, um, what is there for different manufacturers. Um, we have a product line of, for um, testing this kind of uh, protection, like you're testing a breaker failure relay and many other different applications. We have SMRT1, which is a single phase unit to test your relay test set. 36, three phase, you have 46, 410D, which is nothing but increasing of the number of current channels. If you want more current channels, we have the series. Software solutions, we have RTMS, which is a manual software, and ABTS, which is an automated software. So I just show you this slide. We have um, us.mega.com as our official website, so you can go in here and you can see and download some of the application notes, or, or you can see the product line. I would now hand over Mike to Greg so that he can talk about the further slides. Thank you, Mohit. Um, we do have a number of products, like Mohit mentioned, that can uh, meet all your relay testing needs. 
At this time, the uh, webinar is officially concluded, but based on feedback from last year's sessions, we're going to extend the Q&A session for another 30 minutes to answer any questions that you might have. If you have any questions, please submit them now in the Q&A box. For those that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve. As we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, a copy of the presentation will be emailed to you in the next few days. A recording of this session will be available on our website at megger.com forward slash webinars in the next two weeks. Our webinar landing page also contains the schedule for all upcoming webinars and recordings of all previous webinars. If you're looking for uh, any webinar related information, that URL is megger.com forward slash webinars. And make sure to please join us for our next webinar which is Understanding Power Quality Testing on November 18th at 10 a.m. Central Time. And that will be presented by Andrew Sagel, a product manager here at Megger. Now, let's get on to your question. The first question is, failure to trip. Can this also be due to a stuck breaker? Okay, that's a good question. Um, the, the term stuck, um, yeah, it, if you are thinking from the dictionary point of view, yeah, it can happen due to the stuck, mechanically stuck breaker, but IEEE uh, C37.119 states clearly that a stuck breaker means uh, um, failure to close, so it's not able to close the breaker. Uh, that exactly is according to the standard I'm talking, but if you are talking um, from the dictionary point of view, from the English point of view, yeah, mechanically, if it's not able to open, yeah, it's a failure to trip. Um, the second question I have is, uh, okay, hold on. It's related with the slide number 27. So just quickly, I'll go to the slide. Okay, the question is the scheme will de-energize F2. In this situation, will the breaker be closed to keep F2 alive? Okay, yes, that's that's correct. So F2 will always be closed. So what happens here is, this was the scheme initially. The breaker, I did not uh, uh, put a arrow for here. This will also close your breaker F5. It will close your breaker F5. I think uh, the question should be for feeder F3 if I'm able to understand the question. So F3 will be feeded from breaker F5 closing like this. So what is happening, this breaker failure relay will issue command to the breaker failure relays for 2, 3, 6, and 8 to trip but it will issue a breaker failure reclosing logic for the relay which is there here, the closing logic. So um, it will close the breaker five also. That will happen to feed your F3 load. F2, I don't think it is getting affected. It's still, yeah, it's still pro able to provide from this post. Um, which scheme, the next question is, uh, which scheme is recommended for power station applications? I am not able to understand what it means by power station applications. Uh, can, can the guy who asked this question, I mean, ask this question be more descriptive? In the meantime, we will jump on to the to the next question, which is, in breaker failure protection, common or useful is, I'm sorry, is breaker failure protection common or useful when protecting older breakers, for example, a Westinghouse breaker built in the 1960s? I have Mr. Stan Thompson here, who is uh, having a very good knowledge of conventional and electromechanical relays and breakers. So I would just hand over the mic to him to answer. <laughs> 
Okay, so I guess the question is, is when you have older breakers, do you want to use a breaker failure protection scheme? And the question, the answer is depends. <laughs> so uh, for, for breaker failure protection, yes, I mean, um, it all depends on the, the scheme that you've got in place already. So obviously, in this particular case, though, you'd probably be upgrading your scheme from your electromechanical worlds to your microprocessor-based worlds. And so um, then you've got more options available to you in terms of timing, uh, whether you want to uh, break or fail your initiate, uh, et cetera. So I can't really answer that question very easily. I can just say it just depends on what your your actual, um, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to scheme? Um, and, and the answer is probably yes, in which case then yes, uh, the answer would be yes. But if you're in your low, lower electromechanical relays, well, again, it depends. So and that, that's kind of a hard one to answer really. Okay. All right, next question. Um, do we have any more questions here? Oh, there is one more question. Um, in the breaker and the half configurations, all breakers, one, two, and three are shown normally closed. Oh, I see. Um, wouldn't breaker two usually be open? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, that's my mistake. <laughs> If not, it seems the sources A and B are continually feeding together. Uh, that's that's true. Yeah, uh, breaker two should be open. That's that's my mistake here. Any question? Next question we have here. All right, again, if anybody has any more questions, please uh, submit them now into the uh, question box. Um, the next question is re-trip timing. I'm thinking that the question is asked of, of, for the re-trip scheme that is used. Um, I don't know what exactly is the question, or are you asking what should be the timer settings like that, or what 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 it is? I'm not able to understand. Uh, let me go back to the slide where this uh, 551 was there, and it has a retrip scheme. So I don't know what exactly is the question. Yeah. So the retrip uh, scheme here works for providing a second opportunity for the same breaker to trip. Uh, and it is applicable only with the breaker that has uh, two different tripping coils. So what it will do is the first tripping coil, uh, it will see, okay, um, and it will it will say, okay, it's a breaker fail, but uh, I have a second coil and I don't want to declare a breaker failure trip. I don't want to trip my local breakers, so I will give my command to the second coil to trip and give a chance to my breaker to trip before declaring a breaker failure condition. Um, that's how it happens, and uh, um, yeah, that we have uh, the next question. Typically, what is the duration of the BFI time delay on average? It's a uh, one millisecond um, average, so uh, as far as I have seen so far, um, one millisecond. So, protection relay will take like 13.33 milliseconds, and the BFI pickup is like. One one millisecond. One to two. Yep. Um, you can submit more questions. We have uh, more time. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, it looks like we are out of questions at this time. Um, if you can think of anything else, please feel free to contact us offline. Uh, thank you all for attending today's webinar. We hope to see you again at our next webinar uh, coming up in November.